The Healing Lives Center is a center for sex trauma and marriage education and transformation and has the critical mission to strengthen that which God created and values, marriages and the nuclear family. Dr. Gilbert, your host, aims to provide important teaching on tough topics, great interviews and conversations, and tools just for you, all emphasizing a biblical worldview. Join us now with today's feature. Welcome to the Family Features Podcast. My name is Dr. Corey Gilbert, and I am excited today to have a conversation with Eric Wooten from Altered Marriage. So welcome, Eric. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I look forward to this. You definitely have a, a passion similar to mine, so looking forward to our conversation just to kind of what you've seen in our world and your journey and um, how we can see marriages strengthened and family strengthened. So love that. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone else will just listen to us go on and on about what we're passionate about then, huh? I love it. Yes. <laughs> and it's sad, the the status of marriage and families these days. I think it's needs it, to be It highlighted. is. Yeah. No, I just, it was funny yesterday. I'm not a I don't love social media stuff, but you got to <laughs> do something to be relevant, right? And so I saw a, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with who Tia Mowry is. The mm. uh, She's, uh, her and her sister were twins on a, some sitcom back in the day. Right. She's grown now anyway. And so she was on some other show like The View or something like that. And, uh, and there's a clip of her talking about her marriage. She just got divorced. Oh. And and she said, uh, you know, I look at my marriage as a success. And then she goes in this and the, the ladies on there are like, yeah, yeah. You know, she goes in this long thing about, you know, I look at it like a like a college curriculum, you know, like like you learn some stuff and you create some stuff. And at the end, there's a celebration and graduation. And so me and my husband, you know, we have these two beautiful kids and we created those together and then we graduated. And so, you know this is great. And she said, you know, some people look at, you know, the longevity of marriage and say that success would be a long marriage, but I just think it's about being happy. And so I'm just uh-huh. like, I'm like that, that's the state of, so I did, I did a little, you know, side by side thing of, of my facial expressions as she's talking. Um, but it's just that, that mentality that is frustrating to me that, yeah, that should be, um, I mean, you know, no, no shade on anybody who's, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of reasons ma- marriages do fail. Right. Right. And, and oftentimes, uh, you know, you got one spouse that doesn't want that and is doing everything they can to prevent that, but takes two. Um, so, you know, no, no shade on a failed marriage, but like, let's call it what it is. Right. That the idea is to get marriage for life. And, uh, if that doesn't work, that's, that's not a graduation or celebration. That's a, that's a failure. And that's, that's sad. And, uh, so, but that's the, you know, that's the, I think the mentality that we fight, we've just decided we're going to call marriage something else, a curriculum. And it it makes no sense to me, but anyway, yeah, that's why we do what we do. it's It's how we define it. So if we define marriage, um, as it should be defined, defined as in it's not a human construct and it's not some social construct. It's actually designed by God from the beginning as the, the best option Sure, changes kind of why we do it. I've heard, I've heard some college students, Oh my gosh, we were married for two years. It was great. I learned so much, but God's called us in separate directions. I'm like, no, (laughs) he has not. Right. You're wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we make sense of our reality afterwards in a sense to try to make sure, it- Yeah. Yeah. We love we love to go back and redefine uh, you know, what what what's there just to to feel yeah. good about it. And and again, you know, the, it, there may have been a lot of factors for for the ending of their marriage, but let's right. not let's not call it a curriculum and and right. define success by your happiness, not not the like those two kids are now growing up without a dad in the home. That's, that's not, that's not ideal. Right. That's that wouldn't call that successful for them. So. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about you. How did you get here focusing on marriage? What's your journey? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great (laughs) question with zero answer. Ultimately, (laughs) you know, it's one of those things. I think when I look back at the last 15, 20 years of my life, I, I kind of feel like, everything is I've reluctantly done everything um (laughs) kind of kind of fighting God on where I felt him pushing and me not wanting to go so uh, I think you know we've we've got married young my wife and I got married in college so we've been married 28 years now and uh you know the first eight ten years were difficult and we didn't know what we were doing I don't feel like you know we had a little bit of help but I don't feel like 
there was a whole lot of people around us, or, or at least we didn't have the information I think that's accessible now that, that I almost feel like nobody was really <laughs> talking about what it's really about and kind of <laughs> just like, Hey, isn't it great? And you're like, no, it sucks. And, oh. and I don't know how to do this and we can't do this. And so I think we struggled. And then uh, my wife had an affair just short of 10 years into our marriage. And that was, you know, a, a pinnacle moment of kind of like, Oh crap. I think for me is, you know, we're, we're, we're Christians grew up in the church, but I think for me, that was probably the first time in my life where I was kind of like, Oh, I guess I finally found something I had to lean on God for. You know, there's no, nobody's going to say anything to make you feel better in that moment. There's, you know, there's no, there's no quick fix. There's no, you know, and so it's like, Oh, so this is where you decide Mm-hmm. what forgiveness looks like and reconciliation and trusting God. And, you know, um, so I think, it, you know, that was a pinnacle moment just personally to, yeah. to grow and, and trust God. And so that I think was a catalyst for, I don't think changing the direction, but finally being willing to kind of listen to, Hey, what does God have? Uh, you know, I'd been working and doing some stuff for eight, nine years and didn't love it, but, didn't know what else I really wanted to do. And, mm-hmm. and it was just easy to stay. And so I think, you know, that moment was like, okay, I'm listening, God, did, did yeah. you have something else in mind? And so that was kind of the catalyst that led us into ministry in like 2005. So it's been, nice. you know, quite a few years. Um, and through that, so obviously that develops a passion for marriage to go, Hey, you know, we don't, we don't want people to experience what we've been experiencing. Nice. And uh, so I think it was already there. I think the fires kind of got stoked. And and so that led to, you know, the last 17 years of kind of being on church staff, doing different things, but always kind of having my hand in couples, got a counseling degree, uh, worked for a, a nonprofit focused on marriages for a few years. And then in 2020, I uh, launched my own organization, just say, hey, let's, let me just double down, go all in and, and let's help couples uh, strengthen their relationships and singles prepare. So that that's kind of the overview of the journey. Nice. nice. And you went to uh, Southwestern, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got my undergrad at Oregon State University and then got a master's at Southwestern. Yeah. Oh, cool. I went to Southwestern as well back in graduated in 2000. So a long time ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're just Very aging cool. ourselves by giving out dates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's neat. And it's funny to see how in trauma, so in crisis, a lot of, a lot more was born, a, a new sure. passion, identity calling, if you will, and how that has morphed over the years. That's just beautiful. Yeah. You know, I I think it's one of those things that, you know, for definitely for believers, if if we don't seek or find kind of purpose in our pain, then then, you know, you kind of wonder, why am I going through this stuff? And I think if if you know inherently that you're not here for you, which I think most believers should, then then I, I would hope that it would cause us to go, okay then how can what I'm dealing with benefit somebody else, right? Across across the board, whether it's my success or whether it's, you know, my failures and moments of pain. And so I think if if you, you know, if Christians are honest with with our perspective on uh, what it means, uh, what salvation and lordship and direction and purpose for our lives really means, uh, we ought to be looking at both pain and success and saying, okay, this is probably not just for me. So what else can I do through it? And that's where it pains me to see how many Christians are really literally living for themselves, living their life uh, kind of on their terms. They don't see that peace. God has put you on this earth for a purpose. And yes, if you're married, one of your number one ministries is your spouse. Sure. You have children or your number two ministry is your children. But even beyond that, whatever career you're in, whatever place you're in, what has God called you to do? I think we've almost done a good job of not even seeing that as part of the conversation because we're well, very self-centered. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, let's let's be honest, in at least in the United States, it's pretty easy to be a Christian, right? It's, um, you know, it feels like it's getting harder and harder, but... Yeah. Uh, but there, there was a time when, you know, that was regular and everybody was and yeah. it was widely welcomed and, you know, that kind of thing. So that that makes it pretty easy to uh, just go, eh, I'm good. You, you, oh. if, if you're in a country where it costs you, I yeah. think there's a, there's a little higher level of commitment, right? Yeah. 
And then when you go through things that, you know, your drama, trauma, <laughs> I mean, that shapes you and, and actually reorients you as well. It looks like for you guys, it, I mean, it sent you into ministry, sure. into working and serving people. Um, I'm in my 23rd year of, of working in full-time ministry counseling and um, as a professor and it, it's, it's exhausting, but it's also, oh. I, I cannot not do it. So anytime sure. I try to leave, it's, I, I, I have to, because it's like, there's crisis. What would you say are the biggest things you've seen with couples, even just thinking in the last few years? Just like biggest struggles. issues they're facing yeah. or yeah, struggles. Yeah, problems. I think, I mean, I, yeah, obvious, obviously, I think COVID was just, all COVID was, was a magnifying glass, right? Yes, Couples who had great relationships were like, this is amazing. We got more time together. We got, you know, the, and the couples that had been avoiding each other and, and yep. staying busy at work and other places are now, you know, staring at each other all day long going, oh, geez, I just, like, this <laughs> so is true. worse, worse than what I man, imagined. So I think all COVID did was kind of put a magnifying glass on what was already there and, and, and show you. Um, so, so I've seen some couples that's been phenomenal for, Yeah, I've seen a lot of couples who, you know, it's, it's created issues and, and at the very least, I think for everybody adjustments are required, right? I mean, right. I was, I had been working in on a church staff for the six years prior. And so was gone, you know, multiple nights a week and not home in the day and all that kind of stuff. And then I, you know, I happened to launch my own deal, which was, based out of my house and then COVID hit. So my wife was like, dude, this, you're suffocating. Like you're, you're around, you're around too much, you know, kind of thing. And so it's really caused us to have to make adjustments. Okay. What does this look like? What does the space you were used to, how do I give that to you? Yeah. How do I maintain some of this stuff? So yeah, I think, you know, adjustments have had to be made, you know, by everybody just based on COVID. Right. I think outside of COVID, I think most couples, probably one of the biggest areas is just how they manage their differences. Mm -hmm. You know, there's um, where we get along is the easy part, right? It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, so the, is. it's the managing the differences and, and actually the differences that will never be resolved. Right. That, that, yep relationship experts call perpetual problems. You know, it's like a lot of couples think they should be able to resolve everything. And so spend a lot of time and energy and conflict over stuff that you will never resolve this. Now and that's where marriage you... counseling tends to fail. Yo, sure. You're a counselor to fix these things that are actually perpetual problems. They're going to continue. And so then because they, they couldn't and we couldn't, well, I guess therefore, and there's divorce is like, no, Right. Wrong perspective, wrong focus, wrong angle. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's why the uh, the irreconcilable differences is cause for divorce is foolish because yeah. <laughs> that's every couple, man. We got, you know, you got introverts and extroverts. You got, you know, spenders and savers. You got, I mean, you just, there's going to be a lot of things that I think. So, so for me, I think a lot of couples, how you manage those differences really becomes a key to the relationship and just having a healthy expectation of you, you're never gonna, if we're looking for a meet in the middle of 50, 50, uh, win-win compromise, we're just not going to get there. So a lot of what I talk about with couples is, is I call it closing the gap. How do you close the gap? So, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to meet in the middle, but if I take a step towards you and you take a step towards me, uh, that gap is smaller and we're going to have a lot less conflict. And so we spend a lot of time talking about what does that practically look like? to close the gaps. And then, you know, like you said, re reorient the expectation. If the expectation is, you know, perfect harmony. Yeah. You're going to be frustrated all the time. If, if it's the reality of how do I accept some of the things and who you are and those will never change. And then how do we accommodate each other? And, and if we can kind of manage that balance, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think we can make it all right. So. Yeah, I just realized I was gone. I've been gone the last week and a half. I went to Costa Rica for dental work with my oldest son. I got back last week and I just yesterday realized, huh, I never once during that trip worried about my wife. And I, I rewind back to some years prior when we had little kids. And I remember I would be gone just for a few days for something. And I would always make sure I had college students that could come babysit or come relieve her and how I was much more intentional then sure make sure she was taken care of in a sense and how this past trip I didn't even think about it 
It's like, was that just for less? It's just a yeah. new life stage. I was going to say, is that just because you're selfish or because the kids are older and, and you realize she's good? <laughs> kids are older and, and they, how there's different seasons. Like there was more required or different things required when they were little. Yeah. And at this stage, it's it's different. And actually, it's kind of cool to see. But one of the areas, like I know in the, the prepare inventory that I use with couples in premarital and in, in, in married couples is that flexibility is mm-hmm. if you're really rigid you can't handle the changes throughout seasons of life. Things have yeah. to be like they used to be, which again, COVID destroyed, but right. um, they reveal. I, I, I love money and sex and COVID, all this stuff reveal kind of the underbelly of how we're doing, how we're not doing, uh, where we're selfish. But if you think of the way that we're wired, we have two people who are selfish and who know it all. Sure. <laughs> We all think we know it all. Well, we, I mean, the, the reality is right. When, whenever we make a decision, we're making it based on what we know and yeah. what we see. So for us, it honestly is the best decision. Yep. So I, yeah, I'm right every time because time. I'm making a decision. <laughs> yes. just, but then in a relationship, you, I have yeah. this other person who has a voice and a perspective and, oh, that's frustrating. But it's also, if we let it, absolutely redemptive and beautiful as well. Yeah. No, I, you know, going back to your seasons thing, I think that's, you know, for, for couples over the long haul, I think that's one of, one of those things. If, if we can get good at asking each other, you know, like, what do you need most from me now? Right. In this season. Cause I remember, you know, we got three girls who are all grown now, 23, 21 and 18, but <laughs> when they were younger, there was certain things. So when my wife was a stay at home mom, the answer to that question was when you get home from work, that first hour and a half, if you can get them off my legs, give me a break. (laughs) Also, if I'm cooking, let me create dinner or, or just kind of unwind that hour and a half would be the best use of your energy possible. Then there was a season where, you know, kind of bath time and bedtime mm-hmm. was, man, if you can, you know, tuck them in bed and read them their stories and do that while I unwind, that would be great. Then there was a season where it's like, if you can get up in the morning and make sure that we get off to school good, mm-hmm. that's when I need you most. And and so, like you say, if we don't, if we don't ask, we're just going to keep doing what worked in season number one and now you know now now that's when couples are fighting because you know then one's saying you know you never do anything to help me and the other one's telling them all the stuff they do and it's just the wrong stuff yeah maybe you should ask hey in this season when when do you need my energy most because we only have so much right so and maybe we should ask but also oftentimes you have one partner who really is saying hey i need this but because of where the other person's at they're not hearing it yeah so sometimes it's, it's, we are too busy. We are too distracted. It's not because I don't love you. I truly am not hearing you because of my own either stuff or self-centeredness or so being able to really have some moments of check-in, some moments of just really reorienting because it stinks. We drift every couple. Oh, sure. Actually, I'd say every day we're drifting and we're coming back together and there's kind of this ebb and flow we even literally go to work and come home. There needs to be a reconnecting. And then over the weeks and months, it gets even worse. What are some things that you've seen that are like successful tools that couples could use to really strengthen the relationship? Yeah. I mean, if, if I was, you know, anytime somebody asked me like, Hey, what are, what are the keys for couples? For me, it's always three things, community, intentionality, and personal responsibility. And so I think when we, I, and I say that, so I, I'll just break each three down real quick community. I just think couples need other couples who are trying to do the same thing they're doing. You know, when I look back Love at it. the season of the affair in our relationship, you know, part of our survival was our community. We had a good church community. We had people around us, small, all group. We had support. We had, you know, people fighting for us and with us. And I think when you get into seasons, there's just always going to be seasons where your spouse is not going to be your greatest cheerleader, supporter, encourager. And you need that. It's going to be seasons when your spouse doesn't want to be held accountable to you um, because, you know, there's other stuff they're not feeling about you and you need some outside accountability. So I think couples who are isolated are in a dangerous spot. Yep. Uh, intent, intentionality. 
I think we we have bought into some of the myths in the world about relationship and romance, and and we just have assumed that everything good for a marriage should happen spontaneously and organically. And and if it's not, something's wrong with the relationship. And I'm like, no, it's it, you, you you know that works in dating and early marriage where you don't have a lot of the other distractions and responsibilities and. When you're married, it comes down to how intentional are you to make sure the things that need to happen for connection are happening. And because because the business side of marriage is going to force its way in, right? You got to pay a mortgage, you got a parent, you got yeah, like yeah. that stuff. You don't have to plan for that. That will force its your hand. But connection, communication, you know, sex, all those things will just take a back seat. They'll stand on the wall and wait for you. Invite them in if you never do. I mean when you got kids and jobs and all, what, what are the chances that you and your spouse at the same time on the same night, both feel fresh, energized, horny, <laughs> and re- you know what I mean? It's, it's like that <laughs> few and far between. Um, and so I think you, you know, at retirement, honey, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Or, or next vacation when we don't have all the other distractions. Right. And so I think, you know, Couples need to be intentional. Uh, you know, a lot of couples I work with who are not managing both sides well, the the good connection and the difficult logistical conversations. Right. You know, I recommend having a weekly staff meeting to check right. in and force kind of some of the business talk to happen in a certain moment. And then, you know, a date night if they can, a few times a week, just having some quick connections. Hey, we're going to nine o'clock when the kids are in bed, we're going to put our phones down for even 15 minutes, put our phones down play a quick game or, you know, get some couples question cards to facilitate conversation, just connect outside of what needs to be done. And and so too many couples get into a rhythm where all their conversations are either logistical problem solving or conflict resolving. And I'm like, that's not fun. That's nope. not a fun relationship. Not sustainable. And so if you're not intentional with, you know, fun conversations happen Tuesday and Thursday at nine, Date night happens Friday, staff meeting happens Sunday. <laughs> yes. Just, you know, it's it's not going to get in there. So I think intentionality is big. And then personal responsibility is just the idea. And, you know, this working with a lot of people in trauma and as a counselor, if if we don't deal with our own stuff, yeah, it makes it impossible to be in a healthy relationship. And so a lot of the couples that I see that don't make it, it's often not a relational issue, issue. It's a personal issue that, yeah. that, you know, some pain, trauma, woundedness from their childhood that has never been dealt with. And so, you know, if you got rejection issues from childhood and you've never dealt with it, your spouse will never be able to make a suggestion about something they would like you to change in the relationship without you, you know, catastrophizing it and universalizing it. And I'm a terrible person. And so, you know, I think a lot of couples, the marriage work is great, but can't be successful unless some level of personal work has been done uh, first. And so for me, I think those those are encompass a lot of what we talk about. And, and do you do you work with people individually or is it always? As a I at this point, I you know, in the past I have. But since since I launched uh, Altered Marriage, I've really every once in a while I will. But generally, I've just been trying to work with couples and then you know, when there's individual stuff that needs to be done, just kind of refer that out. Okay. Because what I've even found with with the individual stuff, it doesn't always work this way, but I have loved working individually with half the couple with the other half sitting there. Mm. As in they're there, but we're focusing on one because who's the most important person that's going to help you work this out in the end? It's not going to be the helper, the coach or the counselor. It's going to be their partner. Yeah. And so being able to help equip them by example, and they start seeing you're not supposed to know it all. You're not supposed to have the answer to everything. You're not supposed to be able to read minds. You need to ask, you need to inquire, you need to set be that intentionality, set a schedule. Um, and then once you do that for a while, you realize this comes more organically and it becomes comes more naturally. Sure. But. Yeah, absolutely. I think the uh, I I do I do like what you said. I I as soon as you said it, I also I also have the couples in my mind that pop up where you hesitate to do that because you know the other one's going to weaponize 
what yeah. you just said. So you may be addressing some of the individual, like, Hey, I think you really need to address this or work on this. I think it would help. And then now, you, you know, during that week, the husband, the husband's over there, like, Hey, you remember what the counselor said? This is a you issue. Not that, you know, I'm not the problem. I just triggered your stuff. <laughs> so so yeah. it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. That, I agree with you. And then I also see the other side where I'm like, eh, sometimes that's uh, that becomes tricky too. There's so many times I wish, I wish I had a pause button in counseling where, where you could freeze one of them and just look at the other and be <laughs> yes. like, what you need to do right now is is just affirm them and nothing else. Okay, go. You know, yep. <laughs> it's like yep. you're doing everything not not what we need. So yeah. And I was talking to a couple of years ago. I think I was probably 25 years old at the time, just brand new counselor. And I remember this couple, they were dealing with something. And one day all of a sudden the guy, the husband just looked at his wife and was just like, I wish you were more tan. <laughs> and awesome. all of a sudden I was like, porn, basically his porn consumption had all been oh, okay. coming in and he was looking at her going, I wish you were more like the girls I looked at online. She knew it. And I was like, everything we'd been doing just got destroyed in that moment. Right. Like just, uh, uh, 200 steps backwards. And it's like, oh, yeah. oh yeah, how yeah. do I stuff those words back in his mouth? <laughs> right. Oh. You're like, that's, that's not tan, bro. You, you want Latin or something You're like, like this is, you've been feeding yourself something else. Yeah. Oh yeah. So oh yeah, dude. If we, we, we could probably write a book on yeah. what not to say in a counseling office for sure. <laughs> so true. So true. But that's where it's important to know again, the, what does it look like to have a successful relationship in those, the terms you use, the, um, intentionality community, community, personal yeah, community responsibility yeah intentionality community personal responsibility the personal responsibility one it's funny I, I haven't thought as much about that one even though i do trauma work all the time i love you emphasizing that one the other two I've yeah heard, i'm just i like I, that i've I really found do. Yeah, I found, uh, you know, with a number of couples that you start trying to do the marriage work and and you quickly realize that we can't make any progress here. You know, yep. it's almost like I'll give I'll give them the analogy. I'll say, you know, we can keep doing the couples counseling. For me, it's akin to, you know, you guys are running in quicksand so we can have a whole bunch of activity. And then as soon as you stop for a second, we're sinking. And so I'll sometimes just tell couples, I say, hey. Can my recommendation is, you know, either either one individually because I really recognize it, or sometimes it's both. Right. So one or both. I, I think I think what we need to do is see some either individual counseling or maybe, you know, a recovery ministry at your church or or you know s- some kind of thing to address some of these wounds, yeah, personal, the hard stuff. And so I just tell them, I say, can we agree? I know I know that it feels painful relationally, but like, can we agree to call a truce for the next six months? Like your marriage is not going to be good. It's probably not going to get better, but let's just commit. We're not going anywhere. And, and we're going to do, we'll do some little things in the relationship to stay connected. Right. Like, like let's, let's make sure, you know, whatever they're a Christian couple, let's, you know, let's at the very least pray a couple times a week or do a devotional so, something. So there's interaction, but I really don't want you trying to resolve conflict because you can't. And you go to counseling, you go to counseling individually, and and we'll kind of do maintenance here just to keep yeah. from going backwards. And so for a lot of couples, I'll just tell them, hey, let's let's pause the marriage right now. Let's get healthier individually. And then um, and the hard part is because so much of it's either psychological or emotional, it's hard to see. Like it, it, for yeah. me, I'll tell the couple, I'll be like, if if your spouse was in a wheelchair you legitimately would not ask them to get up and get a dish out of the top shelf of the cabinet. Yeah. You just wouldn't because you'd recognize it. And so, you know, it's like, that is what's going on emotionally. You keep, you know, you're asking them to do emotional somersaults and it's like, they got two broken legs. What do we yeah. give them a break? Let's, Love let's, he, let's heal picture. the legs. And then, then we can, we could try to start jogging again. And that's uh, where so I think you, people listening really need to hear what you just said. Just the, the, We're going to take, we're not, we're going to put the marriage counseling on pause. We're going to keep really divorce off the table at this moment. We're going to endure, but we're going to heal the individual work on. And really what happens in that process is oftentimes, not always, they start working stuff out themselves. Sure. Or, and, or it really takes very little marriage work in the end. Once that individual stuff gets kind of taken care of, I love 
I, I know it sounds weird to say this, but I love seeing couples who've gone through an affair or have past abuse see that their marriage partner is a gift from God sure. and that God's going to use that person to heal me. Even though now some, oftentimes that's the person that has been hurting you lately. Like right. I just love seeing that how beautiful God's mercy is versus the mentality of, Oh, mistake. Let's go do it again somewhere else. Let's start over. And ironically, it doesn't tend to work that way. It tends to just repeat <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, what we went back to a minute ago with, with our irreconcilable differences, you, you can remarry and get rid of this specific set, but when you marry somebody new, you sign up for a new set of yep. irreconcilable differences. So you, you may, you'll choose differently, right? So I can avoid the pain of these two moments, but then you'll get, you know, the pain of these three aspects over here. So yeah. yeah so well, not- who's the common denominator in those different marriages, <laughs> right? You, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I had a lady yeah, so. years ago, she was about to marry her sixth husband. And I'd only known her for 30 minutes. And again, I was young at this time. But I remember I just casually made the comment. I was like, so you're about to marry your dad for the sixth time. Right. And she froze. <laughs> no one had ever said that. And or if really? they hadn't, hadn't sunk in. They were all different races and different personalities, but they were all abusive alcoholics. Mm. And I got a letter from her like a, a few years later and she was in her late sixties and she was like, I am happy and I am single and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cause she literally hadn't seen the pattern of every single person was the same, 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 even though they were all. Yeah. Same. That's crazy. I, I read something about that. There's a, there's a great term for it that the psychologist had. It was like repetitive something, but it was basically the idea that unconsciously, we are are attracted to a similar partner, almost in essence, hoping if we can take somebody who's similar and create a new outcome, that'll almost feel like we've gone back and repaired what didn't go right, you know, with the last relationship or dad. It was I, I forgot there was like a compulsive something. And uh, I was like, yeah, you don't you don't even recognize it, but you you find yourself like if I can if I can fix this person. It will reclaim what we couldn't repair and and fix in the back. But that just goes back to that personal responsibility. Like I, I wish singles, if there's singles listening, yeah, put in the work of getting healthy personally yes. um, before you get married. Because because it's it's uh, you know I've, I've said <laughs> I've said this a number of times with couples, but th- th- here's all the things that nobody told me before marriage when I was saying earlier, like, I feel like everybody was just like watching almost like, you know, fingers crossed behind their back, like, oh, this is going to be great. You know, you got this. Nobody told me that, that one signing up for marriage is, is signing up for a set of irreconcilable differences. (laughs) I didn't know that. I just thought you figure it out and you meet in the middle and everybody compromises and you finally get to a place where you're good. I didn't know that that signing up for marriage was you get a front row seat to your spouse's sanctification process. <laughs> yes. you talk about pain. I mean, yeah. if they got a greed issue, they got a lust issue, they got a I need acceptance from people outside of you issue that like probably at some point in the relationship, they're going to make a decision that causes you pain. Yeah. And then back to what you just said, which is a beautiful part of it that I didn't know that. Marriage was agreeing to be part of your spouse's healing process, right? And and the difficulty is you can't force them to heal. They have to choose to do it, but you can either exasperate it or yep. or support and and help the process. And yep. you know, that's what you just said was it's beautiful when somebody will realize man, that, that God gave me this person to help me heal this based on their personality or their commitment or whatever qualities that they bring. Um, and then you realize, man, there's, there's, is a greater purpose that, that I was here and, you know, that sucks, but that's the selflessness part of it. Right. That it's like, well, God could have chose somebody else. I didn't need to endure the pain to help you, <laughs> help you heal, but here I am. Um, and yeah, that's a part, that's, that's a given. Those are givens that nobody told me. I'm like, right. Hey, how about a, throw me a bone over here. Let me know what I'm signing up And it's up not for. about when you're single, you got to fix everything. No. And then you get married. It's the fact is, are you in process? Cause a lot of people are just sitting around waiting. They're not in process. Mm-hmm. They're not growing. They're not working on their stuff. So then they get married and they're confronted with 
themselves and parts they didn't like and don't like and don't you know even recognize but if you're in the process of growing and maturing kind of that discipleship prior to marriage marriage becomes an asset it's sure so like i what i do and i what i've created is the healing marriage and that's kind of what i focus on how do i create a healing marriage where my spouse is my be- biggest gift my biggest fan and also mm. my biggest contributor into my growing and, and and vice versa. Yours is the altered marriage. I love that. The, the use of that altered. So explain what that. Yeah. Means. Yeah. It was um, kind of twofold, obviously just one was just a play on words. Yep. Um, but, <laughs> but for, for me, I also, it's, it's a mentality. So when I, when I do weddings, um, in fact, I'm going to be up in your neck of the woods next week doing a wedding. Oh, nice. Um, but when I do weddings, you know, part of, part of the challenge at the beginning that I give to them is, is, you know, the, the irony of the fact that we're standing here at the quote wedding altar, right? That this, that's what they call it, right? We, yep. we meet at the altar and, and most couples show up on their wedding day focused on what they're getting, right? My best friend, my my confidant, you know, legal sex for Christians, you know, a lot yeah. of things. <laughs> um, but but an altar traditionally has always been a place where you came to give, right? It's a place of sacrifice, a place of selfishness, a, a selflessness, a place of submission, a place of service, right? And so um, it really contrasts the two views you can have of marriage. Either I'm, I'm here to get something or I'm here to give something. And, uh, and you know, again, if you don't heal personally as a single, you, you're going to look to marriage to satisfy some of the issues you've not yet dealt with when yep. marriage usually just, you know, magnifies them. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't usually take care of them. And so, so for me, that was kind of the mentality with altered marriage too, was not only is it the altar and everybody knows that, but it's a mentality. Like the, what do we do? You know, if you're, if you're here for what you can get, you, you're going to do whatever is necessary to get what you think you need. Right. So now I can manipulate, I can withdraw, I can punish, I can control, yep. like, cause I got to get what I got to get. Yep. And, uh, you know, obviously you and I know uh, years into marriage, that's pr- not a real effective strategy. Um, <laughs> for a six <laughs> marriage. So yeah, that was kind of the, for me, where, where altered and the altar came from. Yeah. So then why would a person, contact you or me or someone like that counselor coach like what what's the why i guess why would a person yeah I, a couple for, for for me i think there's a couple reasons one we we don't know what to do yeah i, I even if you, i had a great model my parent my dad was a counselor in the army for you know 26 years he led the counseling department to focus on the family you know they got a great marriage right if you know I, if if there's a better example, I haven't seen it, but I still got married and don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yes. Right. There's some, there's some general principles that apply to all marriages. And then there's stuff that's unique to every marriage and, and how people connect and how they experience love. And so, so I think one, you, you can't know what you don't know and what you haven't experienced. So I think, you know, the, one is information and resources and tools uh, I think another one is certainly, you know, counselors that are skilled in specific areas that, that can help you get unstuck and help you communicate and be translators and that kind of stuff. Um, I also think one of the great things about whether you're taking a class or, you know, going to a counselor or, or doing something, just having a third party mm-hmm. um, bring up an idea immediately neutralizes it, right? If you go to your wife and are like, hey, I think, you know, I think we need to talk about our sexual intimacy. There's going to be immediate defensiveness. Like, yeah. okay, you're coming <laughs> at me. If, if the counselor says, hey, I want you guys to sit down tonight at seven and ask each other these two questions about sexual intimacy, the conversation is neutral now. It, it's not my idea. It's not your idea. So, so I think outside right. stuff at the very least just neutralizes what we're trying to do. And then, you know, at high level can really give us some tools and skills that we we're not going to have because that's not our area of expertise. And then, you know, I said before community, 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 community. So a counselor is some level of community, Uh, uh, you know, a couple's class is I have a marriage membership. And the whole point of that is 
we resource couples with videos that they can watch and worksheets they can do together. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a community aspect where people can communicate with each other online, where wives can talk to wives, husbands can talk to husbands, people can ask for feedback, people can celebrate wins, we do challenges every month. Uh, we do Zoom live Zoom calls for couples where we can do Q and A. The the ladies have a Zoom call just for them once a month. The guys do. So it's just creating atmospheres where it is normal and regular to talk about your relationship, the struggles you have, support each other, and encourage each other. And that's why I'm a believer in community. I think premarital. If 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 you're dating somebody, engaged to somebody premarital something is vital, not only to make you talk about stuff you don't know to talk about and equip you, yep. but, e but even if that didn't happen, what you've done is normalized. We talk to other people about our relationship. And most of the people that have not done that get married, run into problems because we all do. Mm -hmm. And then when one spouse says, let's and go get counseling, they then find out the other spouse says, I'm not doing that. I'm not talking to anybody else. So if you've done premarital, you at least know your soon to be spouse is open yep. to talking to somebody else. Right. And so for me, I'm like, if no other reason, when I do premarital couples, I'm, I half jokingly, but I'm like, even if you get absolutely nothing out of this, you now know mm -hmm. that the two of you will be willing when you get stuck somewhere down the road to go talk to somebody else because you'll need to do that. And for me, that's like, that's invaluable. Yep. If you know your spouse will receive some outside input and accountability, that's security for your relationship for sure. When that was one of the tests for me, I was I met some girl in college and we were looking towards marriage at one point. And one day she was like, I asked about premarital counseling. I was starting to head into the field of counseling. She said, oh, I wouldn't go to premarital. I was done that night. Bye. See ya. <laughs> If you're not going to go That's, do what I'm going to do for a profession. Yeah, I'm out. Of here. Right. That was a deal breaker so fast. I ran. Yeah. I mean, if it, I mean, that's a pretty good indicator that if they're not open to outside accountability, there's going to come a time in a relationship when they're not open to your accountability. And then yep. those are the people you and I see by themselves wanting marriage counseling by themselves because their spouse won't come. And it's like, right. we could do a little bit of work, but. Yep. Not the full work. Right. Yeah. And that's where pre-engagement, premarital counseling, I, I'm a thousand percent for. I think we need, um, we should be just required. But oh, even yeah. what I do is I follow up in the first year of marriage. And part of what I do in that setup of that is within your first year, life's going to happen. You're going to have questions. So it's either going to be a checkup where it's going to be really fun or just yeah. checking up. But it sets the precedence of exactly that, of you're going to need people throughout your life. Or, and I'm my favorite ones, like two weeks after the wedding, they're calling, help, Right. <laughs> hey, let's deal with it now, early, not after it's drug on for six months or six years. Sure. But setting and up again, precedence. Yeah. And again, you've normalized it. So normalized you got those it. couples that are struggling, you know, three months in, but but they think this is supposed to be the honeymoon period and everybody else around them looks like they're doing great. And so now they're, you know, now fear sets in and it's like, yeah. oh, there must be something really wrong with us. And no, everybody's different. Some people, it is a honeymoon at the beginning and other people, it's a eye opening uh, onslaught of differences that is overwhelming. And you go, ah. I well, and Gary I Thomas, didn't. Gary Thomas in Sacred Marriage talks about how we all marry because we think they will make me happy. Sure. But in marriage, you realize my whole life is to serve you. Yeah. Is it yeah. flip flops? Which we need to see which that. Which isn't a whole lot of fun. <laughs> no. When it can be beautiful, but we need sure. to see the reality of it is my job is to serve my wife at every stage of life, everything she goes through every struggle she has, every question, whether it's theological or whatever else, it's, and vice versa. Like her job is to serve me. That is so anti, almost American. <laughs> oh, for sure. It's for so sure. Scary. And, and it's anti, anti romance, right? What's yeah. been put out there. I mean, that's why, you know, when people say, oh, I just love them. I'm like, I'm with you. I'm like, you love the way they make you feel about you. 
That's that's really that's really what you love. You yep. make me feel great about me. Yep. And so the moment you stop or you do stuff that doesn't make me feel good about me, now now yeah. we're in trouble. So yeah. I think we got it. We have to flip that script. That's why premarital is so important. We got to flip that script. You know, I mean, dating dating is not marriage, and most of the dating advice out there right now does not equip people for marriage. You know, it's 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 game playing stuff. You know, yeah. the three day rule and don't call them back. And the, you know, this uh. it's all this game playing some of it some of it's based on on healthy concepts right like the idea of wait three days and don't call them back is you you look like you have a life and you're not desperate (laughs) right that's you look like you have a life quotation exactly so it so instead of playing instead of playing the game develop a full life and you've you've produced what is attractive, right? Yep. That they're not always available, but you've done it in a real and healthy way. That's why I say some of the game playing, the base is good, yep. but but the game to be played is is pushing us down the wrong road. So yeah, I just I remember a girl that. I date I I met this girl. It was after seminary. I met this girl, and I only saw her this one time um, at this some event at church. Every time I called her, she was so busy with life and ministries and things. She just got more and more attractive every time I called her and she said no. So it wasn't conducive to move anything forward. So nothing ever happened. I never saw her again. But I remember to this day, every call where she was busy loving on someone and ministering to someone and serving somewhere, she had a full life. When Mm -hmm. I met my wife, she had a job. She owned her own house. She had an amazing family, an amazing church, an amazing set of friends. She didn't need me to save her life. Right. That was actually intimidating. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. When you think yeah. of the model of you're supposed to come rescue somebody. Right. That model is actually really sick in some sense, too. Oh, for sure. So it was it was for me confronting with that sick model of um, ironically, she rescued me. Like I see it now later and kind of go, wow. Um, like who she was and where she was at was a godsend to me and to see that's, and again, every couple's got their own story and their own beginning and how they ended up in that decision to get married. But marriage, then it's like this huge um, exposure of reality and how do we handle differences? You know, all those things we kind of mentioned already. Yeah, you know, different passions, different callings, different. Um, Absolutely, and then some of that, some of that changes. That's why I think even you know, for 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 me, especially what I'm finding with a lot of singles, and especially singles who are are maybe you know divorced and single again, or mm-hmm. you know late 30s to to early 50s, never been married especially in the church world, I, I think we've got the world is over romanticizing things and, and giving us a false perspective. And then a lot of times the church has over spiritualized. Yeah. Um, when you think back, you know, you and I are both maybe not some of the listeners, but you and I are old enough to to remember the I kiss dating goodbye, um, you know, there. series and the, the no dating. We only court to marriage and that, you know, this, this pressure that we, we created because obviously there's not a mandate for really dating in the Bible, right? You can't go find me seven verses that describe how to date. And so, you know, I think one out of fear, the church is like, we don't want singles sleeping around with each other. So we got to keep them away from each other. They shouldn't date. And, you know, I mean, (laughs) we start, we start creating, but, but we create, we create a pathway and an image that, that just doesn't work. And then you've got these people in their late forties frustrated. They're, you know, waiting on Boaz and all this great, crazy, crazy <laughs> spiritual over spiritual stuff. And it's like, you, you've got to date people to know who you are and, and what you like and what you don't like. And, you know, yeah, yeah, we don't need to be sleeping with people, but, but we need to go out. That's with the people. thing is the definition of dating. Sure. That's where we, it falls to pieces is dating really because I went on a date. It's almost like now I owe you something. So sex is the next thing. It's like, sure. where did that come from culture? And I go, I go out with you twice and we're exclusive. And it's like, I don't, I don't you know, it's going to take me three to five months to even know you. Like, what, what are we doing? We should be. Or in the having, college world, like yeah. you sit down with someone at, at 
in the cafeteria you're going you know you're getting married it's like no yeah It's, it's ridiculous yeah the church world the you know, I kiss dating goodbye. And we've seen what's happened with Joshua Harris. And that's, sure, just, sure. that's just so sad and heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. Um, Josh McDowell's but, true love weights. And you've got the true love weight signature cards, which mean absolutely nothing when they've slept with 20 people. And sure. It doesn't sure. matter what you play. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, like we, we've got to, obviously some of this goes, there's a whole, whole different conversation on, you know, discipleship and spiritual maturity. But I think we, we, we create rules uh, under the guise of spiritual maturity when the reality is, you know, those, those rules don't, don't hold up if somebody doesn't want them to, we've got to teach people to steward their bodies, just like they steward their gifts and their finances and passions and, and, and when they do that and people, you know, protect one another's hearts, then, Dating is not dangerous, right? It's a process of getting to know people and, and having healthy and clear expectations. And, you know, because I, I know people that, you know, have have lists of, of who they want to end up with. And because they're not dating anybody, but just waiting around for God to, quote, bring them the person. I'm like, you, you don't, there may be something you don't know you need because you don't date. Well, yeah, you know, He's, I don't date anybody under, you know, five, nine. Okay. Well go out with the five, seven guy. Anyway, he's probably not going to be your husband, but you may have a depth of spiritual conversation with this guy that you did not know was possible that you now know you need to have in your future husband. So you've learned about yourself. He's learned about himself. Like, well, and I would say if you lined up, so if you took a guy and lined up a row of, you know, a hundred women, we could rock down the row and, and eliminate most of them. And I would dare say, and you probably eliminated some of your best options because For of sure. preconceived ideas of either attraction or preconceived ideas of height or looks or even personalities, kind of like if you do speed dating. Um, my wife was not someone I would have ever chosen to marry um, in the beginning. Like I grew up in another country where I would, I thought I would marry some Hispanic um, sure. First, I'm married a white redhead. I'm like, we have redheaded kids. Like, this is not the life. Her personality is the opposite of everything I thought I would marry. How did I find this out? We met online. We dated. Actually, 10 months later, we were married. God yeah. is incredible. We need to take the risks, but the risks are within boundaries of what is it that I'm yeah. not going to do? I will not. Like, there was no temptation to have sex. Why we both had a very under clear understanding that that is in marriage. There is no even sure. was there a desire, at least on my part. <laughs> of course. Yeah, at so, some point, sure. Yeah. But temptation, no, that's for marriage. But that's because it was decided ahead of time. One of the rules that we have with our kids, and this is more of a it's not necessarily a joke, but you can't start dating until you're a junior or senior in college. And it's not really true, but it's the idea that it's amazing the pressure for teenagers that if you don't have someone, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. But no, I want you to see that you'll start that when it's time and when it's time to fulfill the next steps of it. Now, if you meet yeah. someone in high school and you begin that relationship, okay, we'll talk about it, but we're more involved as parents. But as you launch, it's all on you, which actually is scary. And I think of, I, you know, I met, met my wife in my late twenties, the people in our life were critical. That's the community to help us make a wise decision. And actually mm-hmm. those people, when we sat down with those people and said, we're considering getting married and we only met like four months ago, their reaction was critical to, to my yeah. wife and to me. And they were so excited it perpet- it pushed the marriage, you know, heading towards marriage even faster. If they had been mm-hmm. hesitant, I'm sure my wife would have walked away that day. Oh, you should. Because we trusted those people. What I hear from a lot of college students is they're not going to talk to anybody. It's all up to them. And then they wonder why they're in a mess. Mm-hmm. Like- Which is the community aspect. If you have healthy community, I tell people that all the time. I'm like, I don't care how great this person is. 
if you have community that is good, now some people's community is not healthy, but I'm assuming that the people around you are there because you trust them. They know you, they want what's best for you, vice versa. If you've got those people in your life and any one of them says no, it it shouldn't even be a conversation. It should, it should be that simple to be like, There must be something I don't see because we're going to miss stuff when we're, quote, in love. Right. We're going to overlook flags. And, yeah, so I'm like that. Yeah. Community should if community says no, it should be a no brainer just to be like, I'm now going to assume I must be missing something. Right. But I even tell I tell some of my college students, I'm like, you need a committee. To vet because your radar is so broken, you're only attracted to unhealthy or bad boys or married people or something's wrong because of what's happened in your story, you need some committee to decide whether you can or should or should not go on that date or go on that. But again, I don't see that. I tend to see I'm supposed to know it all. I'm supposed to be the king of my universe. And it's like, you're actually the worst person to guide that. that right. But right. Parents are another one. For some of you, your parents are not healthy. They're toxic. And so they are not part of that committee or that close group because of who they are or choices they've made. But even more so, do you need to have that community somewhere else? And I hope you're intentional as just a single adult to develop that. And then when a couple comes in for marriage counseling, what do they tend to not have? Community. Community. And that's the first thing I ask couples. Exactly. Um, is, yeah. Who, who, who you got besides when you're talking to me, who you got. Exactly. Um, you it can't know. be, and actually, and it can't be just me usually cause you can't afford it. <laughs> right. You can't afford it. And I can't, I can't, we don't have a relationship outside of here. So I can't, you know, that, that was always my frustration with licensure and why I wasn't too excited about pursuing it, but right. was Good. just the, the avoiding the dualistic because I've seen, in church world and marriage mentoring and all kinds of other stuff, I've seen the power of dualistic relationship, right? That not only am I coaching or mentoring you, but we're doing life together on the weekends. We're yep. doing, you know, and, and that, that holistic, you know, relationship provides even more power and value. But I yeah, think you it gotta... is, but, and I love that. I, the question I asked in my twenties in the seminary was, how do you do this in ministry? And they all just kept saying, well, you just don't have dual roles. I'm like, that's not good enough. And then in ministry, all these years of ministry, I think the dual and triple and quadruple roles with people are life-giving, but the level of stewardship mm. is like huge. The protection yeah. and the the, the um, being very careful, like being able to, you walk up to someone at church that you've also seen as a client you don't say, Hey, how's it going? Yeah. So you're realizing I can't ask that question because if we have other roles that we have. Sure. Um, but I, yes, I think that's it. Then you think of the church, the church should be a place where I can go to my pastors and to my small group leaders and to other key people. I love right now. Oh, yeah. my teenagers have incredible mentors and guides when it comes to their small groups and their youth group. Yeah. Everyone yeah. healthy in the youth group. No, there are humans in there. Absolutely. But there, there's places they can go to ask questions. And do I always agree with what they say? No, that's part of the bigger you know, body of Christ and relationships. And it's neat to work together and, and trust people and and then disagree and do life. And that's also marriage, too. Because right. I'm sure for you, like your 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 kids, you've agreed with every decision your kids have made, right? how much time we have left <laughs> don't, don't give me don't run me down that road today i'm i'm here this is why i do marriage ministry not parenting that, that's a, that, would, that would be a uh yeah i have too many failures absolutely not and of course they they don't none of my kids could care less that i have a counseling degree and i talk about my my middle daughter got got married without even really asking and then after marriage like text my wife and it's like hey do you know any good books for like marriage and my wife's like you might have could have asked your dad sometime over the last few months this is what he does <laughs> so it's like your kids they don't want they don't want to hear in the moment but always, it makes me think of the cosby show 
years ago, the Cosby show when Rudy, the little girl was sick and dad goes and gets his doctor bag and comes back with his doctor bag. And Rudy's like, I don't want dad. I want a real doctor. And I'm like, yep. Right. Lit up. Same for in marriage. Big. When my wife yeah. has something going on, I, I sometimes will laugh and she's like, I don't want to hear it. I don't care if you've talked to a wife about the same thing. Stay out of it. I'm like, yes, ma'am. I'm your husband. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I went, when I used to preach, my wife would be like, did you just make that message for me? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely not. It should be universal, but I, I did not create it with you in mind. I'm not trying to send a subtle message on Sunday to, uh, <laughs> to yeah. you. Oh, gosh. That's awesome. Yeah. I love what you do. It's awesome. And I love the the um, altered marriage um, for the listeners, alteredmarriage.com. And then if you go to alteredmarriage.com slash gift, there's a yeah. free download. I've got a couple of free resources. So for, nice. for singles and dating, I've got a daters manifesto on there with just some nice. things to think about. And then I've got another document, uh, on, on just establishing a relationship rhythm. I think that goes to intentionality. So married couples can, can grab that as well. Just some, some free tools to be practical and intentional. Awesome. And you mentioned earlier, along with altered marriage, you've got a membership site with resources and videos and homework and then community and places to engage and to grow. I mean, that's what I, I feel like we're both about that. The goal is strengthen your marriage. Yeah. It matters kind of back to the beginning of our conversation, even your theology of marriage, your understanding that it's designed by God for a purpose is so critical um, for mm-hmm. your, your health, survival, um, ma- maturity, everything, just who you are. So this is a great resource. Yeah. I look forward to, to sending people your direction and kind of what you're doing. Awesome. Uh, yeah. That. Well, thank cool. you so much for this great conversation and, I hope it's been encouraging to to those listening and look forward to further conversations with you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep doing what I'm doing and uh, we'll see if we can help strengthen this thing called marriage. Amen to that and families. And that's beautiful. And obviously we haven't, we said this, but haven't said it probably more explicitly. All of this is from a biblical worldview. With yeah. a biblical understanding of what marriage is, how God created it, that he's the center, one man, one woman for life, and how critical that is when it comes to marriage. So thank you so much for Absolutely. doing what you do. You bet. All right. You bet. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to the Family Features Podcast. It's been an honor to serve. If you're struggling and in need, Dr. Gilbert provides a free consultation for new clients. Check out his website at healinglives.com to book a call. If this has been helpful to you, please share it, leave a review, and help us get the word out so that we can see lives changed, marriages touched, and more people come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. For more help and resources, check out Dr. Gilbert's website for books, courses, and more trainings at HealingLives.com. Bless you and your family and all God wants to do in and through you. Remember, your marriage and family are worth fighting for. This is Dr. Corey Gilbert. See you next time.